Okay, wonderful. So let's let's just get the meeting started and we can do roll call. Okay. Ada Anderson? Here. Andrea Sohaka? Yo. Barbara Boyer? I'd be here. I can't talk. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, you last week. <laughs> Carrie Johnson. Hey, Carrie. Kathy Noon. I'm here. Chris Lynn. Here. Connie Ward. Gina Connie. Don Perez. I'm here. Donna Mullins. Saw Donna a minute ago. Here. Gretchen Lopez, hmm. Jim Dale. Gretchen's going to be a little late, Mindy, but I, I think she is coming. Who's that? Gretchen. Okay. Um, Carrie, you're here. Perla Geller? I'm here. All right. Phil Sernanik. Present. Sean Wood. Okay, and we have a new member, Sherry Hade Vogel. Yay! Welcome. <laughs> Are you here, Sherry? Maybe not on yet. Maybe not. Let's make sure if she when she gets on that we get to have an introduction and yeah, that would be great. And okay. uh, she's from Clear Creek. <clears throat> Steve Conklin. Here. Good morning. Exilum. Tom Mahowalt and Winshaw. Here. All right. And then do we have any guests with us today? Oh, no. Bob, you're muted. What did, did we not call your name, Bob? No, I got left out. <laughs> oh, oh dear. I said Bob Rocker and I checked you and everything. Oh, okay. Well, sorry. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> must have answered for you. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. And then we we just have a, a variety of Dr. Cog staff. We won't go down that whole list. A smattering of them. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, good to see everybody as always. And if we don't have any guests, I imagine we don't have public comment. But let's make sure. Okay. The report of the chair is very brief. I want warm weather. That's it. <laughs> I really don't have a report. So we can we can just move on to Jayla. Yeah, and I don't have a very big report either. As I said earlier, I'm in South Carolina at Desto Island. So I've been off for the last week, um, having a good time, which is wonderful. I did want to tell you, I've presented the presentation I'm going to give to you. Remember, I was sick last month. I had COVID, so I couldn't give it to you. So I gave it to the board of directors first, which is a little bit backwards. Uh, they saw it. They're, they're okay with it. I'll give, yeah, I, I presented it a different way than I will present it to you. And I was on speed mode, wasn't I, when um, <laughs> during the presentation, I was talking so darn fast. Um, <laughs> So we might have a little more time to dig down into the data. Uh, uh, and I think it is more important for you to understand a little bit more about it uh, than I gave to the board of directors. Um, let's see, uh, there's a couple of bills that we're watching closely at the federal level that are including, one is for fall prevention, which is pretty exciting. And I have been corresponding back and forth um, with people in Washington this week um, to see if we can get some movement on that. Some increased funding for fall prevention in the Older Americans Act, that would be very nice. And then um, there's uh, the Chronic uh, Care Act, uh, point two. There was a Chronic Care Act uh, a couple of years ago, and this is a second one, which really uh, is, is trying to get community-based services looks like only nutrition and transportation 
um, into Medicare funding, but hey, that could make a really big difference, right, for us. And so um, we, we are watching that and working on that. Um, I know there's a couple of things going on at the state level, not so much related to us, but um, definitely related to um, helping older adults. Uh, Bob, do you, do you know where we are on the bill, um, the CU and shoots bill? I think it's up for, um, no, I don't know exactly. So okay. I, I, <laughs> That's to I, increase. I can, that. I can tell you in a few minutes, but not right now. So. <laughs> can you explain what that is um, just quickly for folks? Yeah, the, the idea behind the bill is to provide um, ongoing, actually ongoing funding uh, to train uh, two people per year from each of the medical disciplines that are taught at CU Anschutz in, and to teach them in the field of geriatrics. So it would be like another, I think it's not, it's either nine months or a year of additional schooling. Um, and it would be specifically focused on geriatrics. So we'd have, it would be for MDs, um, PAs, NPs, uh, dentists, um, pharmacists, and uh, I think um, social workers too. So, um, and the cost of it is, uh, it's about a little over a million dollars a year. So, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, as I recall, it's, it's in the uh, area of um, one of the finance committees right now, if I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah. It's a tight budget year, so it may be difficult to get through. And this isn't the first time it's come up. It was, um, we just hope we, we just really need to, to, to try and get more geriatricians, geri, you know, people that, that um, practice uh, in geriatrics, because uh, it's a little bit different, right? When you're, even with pharmacists, when you got four different comorbidities going on and you got all sorts of medications you know and as an ombudsman we used to see people come in with 19 different medications um and the interactions that go on between those and that and the damage that it can do to your body so i think it's really important i hope this if it doesn't go through this time phil you had your hand up you you know more well i i i, I think i've read through it and um one of the, the components that's behind it is to uh, actually also provide some skills around using telehealth in the geriatric space, mm -hmm. being able to link uh, between, um, I'll call it uh, rural and frontier, uh, particularly, uh, which we do have within the Denver region, um, and make that, make that link. And I think that's an important part is to uh, take what are um, thin resources around the state and try and increase their numbers, but also use them in very effective ways. Yeah, you know, I, um, I'm here with my best friend who's a, a doctor in Ignacio, Colorado, and she was talking about telemedicine and the nightmare of tele telemedicine in a rural area because the connections are so hard. She says, I get about half of what they're saying and they get about half of what I'm saying. And it's, you know, I'm not exactly sure what's going on. And um, I, I, I got a real um, appreciation for rural healthcare right now. She was telling me how many um, physicians have left like the Durango area um, because they're just working them to death. Uh, she said there was a wonderful urologist that had started about a year and a half ago and she's newly married and um, she was getting, you know, like 70 patients um, in a week, which is a lot for a four day week and, you know, doing all the notes and all the coordination. And um, she said, yeah, I'm leaving. I, you don't pay me you know, enough. It's um, overworked and I can't, and I don't have a life. You know, Jayla, to um, add to that, and so true, it's not just in the rural areas. We have two internal medicine docs in our family. Both of them, um, well, they're seeing physicians leave at a, num a, a record number. Yep. 
uh, pace. Healthcare has been so draining the last three, four years, three years yeah. with COVID. And I think I read something statistically that it was ridiculous. 52% of the physicians today that were surveyed hope to leave healthcare within the next seven years. They want out because they're overworked, they're understaffed, and it's exhausting to them. It's just exhausting. So, and that's a little worrisome with healthcare in rural areas because of um, the internet, but then the hearing with our older adults. And, and then and, and the quality of internet service, right? Yeah. Um, not yeah. everybody has it. And so there's a lot of work to do in, and it has to be multidisciplinary. It's not just, you know, like well, our caseworkers will go to somebody's house to set up the call for a telework call because they don't know how to do it. Um, and, and help facilitate that. And so, you know, it's just not a simple answer like that. That's a good step forward, but it takes, again, um, I'm going to say this over and over, a lot of people doing some really amazing planning. It's the implementation that has to be done. And people, all those people on that implementation circuit have to be coordinated and talk to one another um, so that we can make sure these things, if the money passes, that we're actually going to be able to implement and do things with it. But you got to include every piece of the, of that, you know, of the pie there uh, to make it successful. And that's what people don't do. They don't talk to us, right? Or they don't talk to the AAA in Trinidad when they're putting in a line to say, do you have someone that could help translate um, in Spanish? Or, you know, do you have, they don't, they don't go that extra mile and make it as inclusive uh, to make sure it's successful. So that's my little soapbox for today. Um, <laughs> uh, I just, yeah. I just sent you, uh, you and Mindy and Carrie, um, the email that I got from Jody Waterhouse and it explains the bill and it also asks for people to email senators and representatives at the state to um, show their support of this bill. So um, it may be many. Yes, and that's important because um, there is some other issues around hospitals uh, that are occupying some of the lobbyists at the CU Anschutz campus. So uh, it's House Bill 231031. And uh, if you go out to the website, I think there's a opportunity to send something to your senator and your uh, representative based upon your address. Bill, you have been corresponding back with Rich. Is this the bill you guys are working on? Uh, it's one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Is there another one you're working on? Uh, well, um, yeah, well, yes, we're, uh, we have sent a uh, principled letter, uh, Chris can also help in on this, uh, that is going to the administration as well as the legislature uh, around all of what uh, the administration has kind of uh, been at the point on with regard housing across the state of Colorado but it very much mentions principles we would like to see included uh, along the lines of affordable and accessible to older Coloradans, uh, that meaning using universal design principles and such. Uh, it's a pretty long letter. Uh, Rich has it, because uh, I think he um, and Corinne uh, kind of put it together, uh, but that is available and. You could probably send that. Um, you can get it from Rich more easily than I think I could find it, but um, it's out there and it's a pretty strong set of principles. I don't think anyone in this group would object to any of them that are included there. Um, as long as you get over the governors and uh, possible legislators uh, trampling upon home rule cities and counties and what they do. So um, if you get over that, you realize that what it's trying to do is say, if you're looking for creating more residential um, units uh, across the economic spectrum, uh, these are some things to consider 
because uh, of the next 150,000 residential units needed in the state, more than half of them are going to be older Coloradans. Phil, would you mind sending that information to um, Mindy and... Because we'll ask for it for it, Phil, and Mindy yeah. can send it out. That'd yeah. be great. Thank you, Jayla. <laughs> I, I think they have it all in the same building there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's great i think that, that's my report unless someone else has some questions i just wanted to say that i'm spending time with my daughter this weekend who's a teacher and their dilemmas in the education system are just as bad it's it's almost like we're saying the same thing it's, yeah absolutely it's really frightening i'm with also the teachers here with leaving donna teachers leaving burnout yeah, yeah. I'm also here with the school superintendent of Ignacio, um, and he he said the exact same thing. I mean, it's so similar to healthcare. Um, we were just, uh, you know, if we could only, if they'd only listen to us. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. All well, right. Well, this is Kelly, and I will mention that our neighbor works for RTD. He's a mechanic. He said they lack 1,000 positions. RTD? Wow. Yes, 1,000. That's a lot, Kelly. <laughs> it's really interesting to me, you still are seeing all these uh, short staff lacking 1,000 positions, people leaving their job. I don't understand how everybody's still paying their bills. Uh, I mean, that is- Harry, they moved out of the state of Colorado. At, well, there's got to be something going on there because <laughs> you just think, well, wait a second. These there's these mass exodus. Um, what is the the quiet quitting? Yeah, that that's the thing. People are just quietly quitting, but it's a very strange time. So, all right, let's move on. Um, well, I, uh, uh, Carrie, you, if, if, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll just. Um, Mention one of the other things that's complicating uh, what's happening at the legislature on a, a number of points uh, that impacts uh, some of our older Coloradans, uh, which is, um, and probably folks have seen it, uh, it ash, ash, issues around facility fees being charged by hospitals and recognizing that the um, State administration is looking to drive lower healthcare costs, but they also need to be considering that somewhere along the line, uh, healthcare does require some brick and mortar presence because that's where you have hospital beds and provide some levels of clinical care. And um, uh, there, I don't have an answer to it. Uh, I haven't met anyone that has a great answer to it, but. It's um, driving the margins. And then you see that the Colorado insurance option plans uh, are also receiving some resistance on the part of insurers. But on one side, um, some insurers and some hospitals have had banner years, but a number of insurers and a number of hospitals uh, have been underwater recently. So it's a very complex issue in trying to balance something that works towards everyone's objectives. And uh, I think uh, some of the things that uh, I'm gonna read between the lines and the panel set I reviewed quickly from Jayla, uh, that um, trying to drive folks to actually better health habits uh, along the way is going to be something that is going to be important as well, because that's the only way we're going to at least have a, a pocket of air to breathe, uh, I think. So, yeah, thank you, Phil. Thank you. Okay, if we could um, uh, what move to approve the minutes from last time. Is there, does anybody have any? Um, Changes or Bob wants to move it. Okay. <laughs> Second. Anyone opposed? 
All right, we shall approve the minutes. Wonderful. Let's see. Is Sharon going to be joining us? I did not see Sharon on. It looks Where like is Travis she? is going to do it. Yes. Travis is going to do it. It's the Travis show. It is the Travis show. Hello, um, Travis. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yeah, let me share uh, the, the list here of the projects. Um, so presenting to you all today the, the recommended projects and funding for our contracted services for next fiscal year. Um, so as you all know, uh, Dr. Cog does contract with various community-based service providers to provide services to older adults throughout the region. Um, and so uh, we typically do issue RFPs on a two-year cycle. Uh, we did switch it up a little bit this year, and we issued RFP for a set number of services to stagger it out and then allow other providers to submit contract renewals. And so just so you understand why this is split out. Um, as I would scroll through here a little bit later, uh, there's a subset for contract renewals, and then there is a subset here of proposals. Uh, we are just trying to, essentially, we will release an RFP every year uh, just to make the, the number of proposals every year that we review um, less there. Uh, so Dr. Cog did release all of this in the fall. Um, we received requests uh, for, from the RFP from 24 organizations to provide services, and then we also opened it up for 21 providers, current providers to submit requests for contract renewals. Uh, between these uh, these two requests and also the transportation requests, which we'll talk about after this piece here, we received requests for tw over $22.6 million. Um, there is approximately for next year, uh, approximately $16.5 million in available funded for cross contracted services. Uh, so there is quite the large discrepancy there. Over the last month and a half, the ACA funding subcommittee uh, reviewed all of these requests and or make, make the recommendations here for you, for your uh, consideration. Uh, because of the large difference in available funding, uh, most pretty much all the, the uh, the requests here were set to level funding uh, to the current fiscal year prior to us awarding additional funding uh, that we did award in January of this year. Um, in addition to that, none of the new requests for new programs were awarded funding. Uh, that was just our way of making it so uh, the funding that's available. Uh, there just wasn't a money available for any of that. Uh, I will also you know, invite the funding subcommittee if they have anything they would like to add. Um, I will also scroll through here, but I'm also happy to answer any questions that you all have. Travis, you might make that just a little bit bigger for people to see. It might be nice to hear from uh, the the subcommittee, Don, if you wanted to, to share. Good, yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks to our uh, funding subcommittee, we worked really hard to get this down. We really understand that there is limited funding and we really were unable to assist a lot of programs that um, we thought were, you know, were good programs. We just, um, we focused on those items that are the priority in in our, in our area. And um, so, that's kind of how it came out. If there is additional money, money coming for some reason, we will certainly revisit uh, those items that are um, that we were unable to fund or unable to fund at any uh, additional amounts. So this is going to continue to be an issue. Um, we understand that uh, there will be even less money next year. So we've really got our work cut out for us. Well, she really as we do. know, I'm going to work really hard for more funding, but I, you know, it's, it's going to be hard. This was really a difficult meeting for me. I, 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 I you know, I just listened to the funding subcommittee and it was um, very hard for them to cut or, or to find, you know, so you could see the request was for 22 million. We only had 16, five about to give out. And, and so those were really difficult decisions because our, our contractors, for the most part, are doing an excellent job and doing innovative programs. And, and, and you know, we just didn't have the money to give them. Um, and so it, you know, I didn't sleep for a couple of nights very well um, thinking about this because uh, I know what it means to these 
to these agencies, but I also know what it means to the older adults that receive these services. And it's really a hard pill for me to swallow. So uh, it, it was it, very it, painful for it all was. of us. It was. Um, and you guys are so professional and so thorough and had really good documentation and, you know, discussed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth um, and advocated for, you know, programs. And then, but the bottom line is you still just only have what you have. So I got, I got to get, I got to get working. And one of the things I've been thinking about is all the things that we can, um, that's why I'm, I'm thinking this year at the federal level, we have a better chance of getting some increased funding. Next year's the state level, but I have no idea what it's going to look like at the state. Well, Chris, Chris Lane has his hand up. Oh, Chris, go ahead. I didn't see that. I just, I just wanted to say thank you to the subcommittee. I know this had to be incredibly difficult. Um, and uh, Jayla, I think you weren't the only one not sleeping. Um, a little, a little bit, but uh, just looking at you know all of the requests and what was actually funded, um, I, I appreciate all of the work that goes into that. And um, I know that not only us here at SRC but others, we're all trying to figure out how we can do di things differently and how we can better continue to serve the people we serve. Um, but also how we can find other funds elsewhere to do that. But it's really tricky. But really, I just I just wanted to say thank you because we recognize clearly how difficult that process had to have been. Boy, I second that, Chris. I I know that uh, that's hard work to come up with um, recommendations. So thank you again. Um, for the whole team working on that. I had a quick question, Travis, you had mentioned there were, you weren't accepting new programs or they didn't get funded. Are they on the list? I was just curious what the new programs might be. I missed it. Uh, I think, Fit. Yeah, Jerry Fit was one that was new. Okay. Um, and then AgeWise I think is the only other one that was new, that wasn't funded. Okay. Boy, thank you again. But, but there were some programs from existing providers that didn't get funded. They would be adding a new program. So they weren't necessarily a new provider. But um, yeah, if you go into, you know, yep. the home delivered meals in Denver Inner City, there's a few others like that, that we had deep discussions about Um uh, and and I was the newbie to the group this time around, and you know this was a huge, a huge task. And I've always appreciated them, but now I've said, "Wow, this is this is really a difficult one, especially when we were cutting and expecting there to be more cuts." And I would just add that I think that's why we were so hesitant to put new programs in, is because you're ramping up, and then next year we say we've got to cut even more. Made that. Um, you just can't set people up for failure. So that was that was very much a concern. But you know, people were responding to the needs. And so you understand why those new programs are there. But when we don't have the funding, we don't have the funding. Right. That's a good point, Kathy. Ada? I just wanted to add to what Don was saying. This is probably one of the most painful processes that I've gone through in a long time. Uh, by the time we were through, I just almost just sat here and cried a while but oh, you know it's it had to be done it was hard to do because you can't stop thinking about the people that that are getting the services and it was hard <laughs> we did what we had to do and hopefully next round it won't be so i mean uh, there's always hope that we'll have a good a, a better funding here <laughs> we'll see it's well hard. We all appreciate all the thought and consideration and tough decisions that you guys make on all of our behalfs, but primarily on the behalfs of the older adults everyone is serving. Well, the, the nice thing about the, the efforts on the other side is that uh, there's a whole line of accountability that comes with these um, 
amounts that are that are put out. And so uh, I applaud the group in looking at the effectiveness of what is granted and uh, do appreciate that um, folks actually go through an, an accountability ex exercise around this. So we know that the money that is granted uh, is needed. Yeah. Thank you. Kathy, are you talking? To my husband, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you for watching my mouth move. <laughs> okay. All right. Are there any other questions or concerns before we, or Travis, do we need to approve this before you go on to transportation? What would you like to do? Yeah, they are separate approvals. So okay, and, and we need the abstentions too, Carrie. Yep. I'm abstaining. Who else? Perla. Um, Perla's abstaining. I am as well. Chris Lynn. Bob Brocker and um, Bob Boyer, because they're part of H Wise. Yes. Okay. Well, we didn't get anything, so <laughs> whatever. Okay. Okay. All right. Shall we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second by Winshaw. Are there any opposed? All right. Motion shall approve. Thank you. Ready to move on the transportation. I'm hoping I can just switch over here, but let me know if that didn't uh, share. I don't know, I will make this a little bit bigger. Um, uh, so we do issue transportation calls separately from the other funding. Um, the reason we do this is because there are two other fund pots of transportation money, the human services transportation tip set aside and the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding. Uh, those three funding, these three funding sources really do fund similar projects across the region. Um, and so they are coordinated and we issue a call for all three funding sources uh, for transit projects, transit capital projects, operating projects, as well as mobility management projects throughout the region. Uh, for this one, we did receive, I believe, 16 proposals. Um, I'm pulling up my notes here to make sure I have that right. Uh, yes, proposals from 16 organizations. They requested uh, nearly $11 million. Um, there are, between all three of these funding sources, uh, $8 million in transit funding available. Uh, so this project, we do uh, convene an independent review panel of transit experts, as well as uh, Ada Anderson set on this committee as well to represent the ACA um, to make these recommendations. Um, the committee here today is approving the Older Americans Act recommendations, which is the far right columns here. Um, the HST and FTA 5310 funding uh, is under the Transportation Planning Division at Dr. Cog and has gone through uh, the Regional Transportation Committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee for approval prior to going to the board. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions here about these projects that you all may have. When thanks. Um, Travis, my question is more generic, not specific to these, but um, part of what we have seen recently um, is the proposal for new pricing through RTD and whether it applies here or through uh, one of the other mechanisms. If you're over, if you're 65 or over, um, an eco pass would be very uh, cost effective. Um, and I don't know if uh, that is something that uh, we could consider as a group and maybe even work with RTD on that. Um, but I think when we look at some of the even the Uber rides are going to be really expensive when compared to uh, what was it, a $37 or something uh, monthly eco pass through RTD? Yeah. Um, and I, yeah. So the monthly passes, the new pricing there, the, I think for, yeah, 60, 
it's yeah 65 and up is 27 dollars, which is really really cheap um and so yeah i mean there are a few programs even under the older americans act money that you know give out uh transit passes for rtd and that definitely is something that we need to look at as we go and it once that's approved i think it was hopefully in place by 2024 so once that happens definitely we all kind of need to look to see where we can start giving those out instead of individual tickets um, or any other place like that because that is significant savings over even buying individual tickets for people very good thanks good insight win as usual travis i have a question and you i i would just like your explanation could you describe what all falls into mobility management, that category. Sure, um, it's pretty broad, but so operating like one call, one click centers, so one one stop shop for transit services falls into there, operating a transportation brokerage, um, uh, any sort of efforts with local coordinating councils, or regional coordinating councils, anything that goes into coordinating transportation trips, uh, travel training is also a part of mobility management. Um, so it's really a pretty broad category. Um, really, uh, the best uh, sort of example of mobility management program and only mobility management program is Dr. Mack. Um, that is what Dr. Mack does across the board is mobility management. But then I noticed there were some other um, entities that wanted to do mobility management. So really does it you don't really have to solely focus on the one thing, right? Correct, yep. So okay. depending on uh, the, the different projects, so uh, like a little help here, Boulder County, these are all volunteer coordination, um, which falls under mobility management. Uh, you know, Dr. Cog, Dr. Mack, that's all travel training type of projects and also transportation brokerages. Um, VIA, this funds their call center and their travel training programs that they do, travel plans that they work up for folks. So, um, okay, and then, thank you. yeah. Are there any other questions about transportation from the group? I can't see everybody's hands. So let's see, Mindy, do you see any hands? I do not see any. Okay. All right. Well, if we can have a motion to approve, and it looks like we're only approving the Older American Act, Act um, recommendations here. So moved. Bill, okay, a second. Second. Second from Jim Dale. Hi, Jim, I haven't seen you. Any opposed? All right, so moved. And we have the same extensions. Do we don't need any abstentions for this one, right? Uh, probably just Carrie. Okay. Well, I did. No, I would that. like to. This is Tex. So I'd like to abstain. Okay. Oh, board Thanks. member. That's right. Okay. Wonderful. All right, so moved. Um, Boy, those are so two big accomplishments. Two. Um, this is Andrea Sahaka. I'm on the Dr. Mack board, so I should abstain. Oh, thank you, Andrea. And, and I'm on the little help board, so you can count me out too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you, guys. If you're not abstaining, raise your hand. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay. If you're not you know, on another 12 boards, raise your hand. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Travis. Boy, this was um, this is also a big accomplishment to go through all of those requests. A big job. When will the others? Yes, Jim. I was just observing. Uh, I felt so proud to hear all the people who are busy, busy people being more busy by volunteering for this and all the other things. And so I'm just awfully proud of my colleagues who step up like this. Thank you. Boy, that's right. Okay. Well, let's see where we are in the agenda. Travis, did you have anything else for us? I do not. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Well done. 
Um, now we have, let's see, Jayla, where are we? We've got that. Mindy, where are we at in there? We're at Jayla for the four year yeah. plan. Jayla, here we go. Here we go. Let me get there. Um, come on, from the beginning. There you go. Yay. Can you all see that? Yep. All right. Are you ready for this? Because it's kind of long. So I'm going to try and be as entertaining as I can be. <laughs> but let me uh, explain this. Uh, the Older Americans Act um, requires that we do a, a, a four-year plan on aging um, every four years, obviously. This plan covers 2024 through 2027. I know that looks like three years, but you got to count it 24, 25, 26, 27. <laughs> um, this plan is used to create the Colorado State Plan on Aging. The Administration for Community Living uses it. Uh, let me see, I gotta minimize you guys. Uh, uh, to identify trends and needs and develop service priorities, spending allocation, and then also demonstration projects. So it is important. They do, people do read this. Um, Percy Devine at our, at our federal level reads it and sometimes asks me questions about our area plan on aging. So I know it's read. Um, the administration on aging develops the plan format, right? And the questions. So you're going to see, it, it, I, I, I describe this as, it's like you're walking into the middle of a conversation. It's not as comprehensive as I would like to see it. For example, this plan doesn't ask anything about housing, but we know housing is a huge issue for older adults. Um, they had specific questions that they um, wanted answered, and this is how they asked those questions. And then they all, then the state can add additional questions. The plans do. Um, to the state on March 30th, and it can be amended during the um, plans terms. And sometimes we've done that, we've amended it. Um, probably should have done that during COVID because we didn't get a lot accomplished those uh, two and a half years. Uh, the areas of focus in the plan include public input. Public input is really, really important in this plan. They want to know that you went out and talked to people. Um, demographics, they wanted to understand the demographics of our region. The community assessment survey for older adult results are called out. Volunteers, they wanted to know what, where we are with our volunteer programs and Kelly Roberts helped us a lot in that section. And then COVID-19 pandemic response. They also ask us about our core services. They want us to tell them about what social isolation, the impact of social isolation during COVID and, and what's going on now, the ombudsman program, legal assistance program, diversity, equity, and inclusion. First time we've seen this in the four-year planning process, um, really a lot of questions around that. So I think that's a good thing. Targeting and outreach. Remember the Older Americans Act asked us to target certain populations those folks that are over 75, those folks that are low income, low income minority, those who are socially isolated or geographically isolated. Um, innovation and expansion of services. So what are we gonna try and do, which is challenging as you see, um, you know, it's like uh, you want innovation, but we don't have additional dollars. That's kind of hard to do. And then other services, kind of general topic. Uh, the input section, remember I told you that input, getting input from older adults is really important in this plans process. And we did COSOA, um, which looked at 17 aspects of livability and you guys are familiar with that. You will also get a presentation on COSOA next month. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it now. Um, the community assessment survey, uh, this, this is the fourth time we've done COSOA. Uh, as you will recall, it's with the National Research Center in Boulder, and they partnered with Polco. Um, it's a statistically valid survey uh, identifying the strengths and needs of the region's older population. This time we sent out the survey to over 39,000 people and only 4,595 sent it back, which was really discouraging for me. That's a response rate of 12.5%. 
it wasn't great. We do have a margin of error rate though of 1.45, so that's good. Um, but uh, you know, uh, this is continuing. Last time we did it, it was a low response rate as well. Um, and I think it's, it, 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 we asked uh, National Research Center what they thought about it. And they said that they, it was a combination of two things. One, COVID and people's kind of just lack of wanting to respond to things. And then the second is, is fear of um, fraud and giving information that, you know, we tell everybody and their brother not to give anybody any information because it could be used against them. And I think in these situations, it, 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 it probably hurts us as well when we're trying to get survey information from people. We Jayla? Did, yes. A, a quick comment on, on survey results having been involved in lots of them. Uh, has anything, anytime ever um, anticipated rather than just sending out surveys, also doing phone interviews uh, to be able to complement that volume, to be able to validate and reduce actually the margin of error? Um, but, yeah, um, we didn't. We we talked to National Research Center and said something's got to change because this isn't working. You know, we sent out the pre cards. We sent out a card that says the survey is coming, and it's you know legit. And uh, I don't know what happened in some communities. I think they did a better job. Like like in Trinidad, they got a ton of response rate. Um, I think we probably should have done more. And social media and letting people know we got a lot of folks I, I think Mindy can attest to this as, uh, as well as people on the information assistance line mad that we sent out the survey um, so I, I think you're right we have to look for another way to reach out to people um, but I don't know Phil if people would be more comfortable in doing it on the phone I know my mom would hang up on me or anyone who is calling for this kind of information because she'd be suspicious She'd be nervous that you know someone was going to use it for it, ill-begotten gains. Um, so I, I'm not exactly sure what to do, but I think we have to think about how we do this different. So would... that's why we do the community conversations, and we met with 250 participants. Uh, we went to the Eastern Plains, we went to the mountains, we did Spanish speaking, we conducted. Um, uh, conversations with refugee communities. We had low-income residents and people who are homeless and uh, veterans. Um, we also had key informant session with 61 community service providers. Let me know if somebody has a hand up because I cannot see it. So uh, I, it's important- Jim Dale remember, has his yeah. hand up. Jim, Jim, Jim uh, Dale. Jayla, do we, yeah. do we get, I know it's a small response, but is there any statistically valid things for counties or cities that yeah uh, each each um and you remember you have your own COSOA so that's on the Dr. Cog yes. website um and so the county I'm glad you said that there are county reports and um uh we did uh city reports in Commerce City Golden and Aurora so those are available on our website. And Mindy, if you want to send the link, that would be wonderful. Yeah, it'd be wonderful. And you, you, you report this, some of the same stuff to the Dr. Cog board. I'm presuming. right. I did. This is the same exact presentation. I should have given it to ACA first, but I was sick on that uh, yeah. on our last meeting. I had COVID, so um, you're going to get to hear it twice, aren't you? So lucky, Mr. Dale. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a counselor anymore. You remember? <laughs> oh yeah, that's so, right. That's right. Uh, so I, I would hear it if I was a good boy and watched the council meetings. But but thank you. It's 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 so important for me to keep to try to inform the, the city staffs across the Dr. Cog yeah. region about what's going on, so they don't forget about the seniors and yeah, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Hazeman saw this as well. So yeah. um, hopefully, Paul, yeah. I bug Paul all the time. I think he's doing great. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, remember, yeah. Yeah. I, 
Phil, I know you have your hand up, but I almost wonder if we could hold questions and until after Jayla gets the presentation, because I know it's going to take a while. Okay, I, the, it's a real quick comment, which is um, in going through it, it's a it's a study at at a point in time. And Jayla, maybe you could include some anecdotal comments about if there's been any changes or uh, levels of response or areas of issue that are different than the past. That's all. Yeah, okay. So demographics, remember it's really important to take a look at our demographics because we wanna know where those over 65 are living, where those who are low income are living, and then um, those who are minority. So that's what you're gonna see over the next couple of slides here. You can see the darker the color, the greater the percentage of people over 65 in the region. So you can see that Gilpin and Clear Creek, more than 25% of their population is over 65. Jefferson County, that kind of Western side, and then um, uh, uh, you know more rural side, and then Douglas County. You also see that pocket of Arapahoe County. What is that community? Does anyone know? Um, I keep on. <laughs> that little square of darkness, uh, that's an older population. So when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, okay, when we're reducing, if we have reduction in, in money, right? How do we target our services? And these maps help us figure out how to target our services. I think that includes Bennett. Okay. No, it's closer in, isn't it? Maybe, maybe it's, it's Bennett, it's yeah. I have to ask our GIS, and I keep on forgetting to do that. Um, these that are, are considered low income, and the darker the color, this is greater than 12% of the population. So looking at this, the darker the color, the more um, low income population they have. Taking a look at these little pockets in the region could really target services there. This is for um, minority populations. And you can see the, the pockets, you know, Denver, um, some in Broomfield, up in Brighton. Um, so you can see the pockets of service. Now, if you, if you take all three of these maps and overlay them, that's what I'd like to look at. That's where we could really target to meet the Older Americans Act dollar or to requirements. The hard part is, is that everybody, whether you're, you know, not don't fall in those categories or not need assistance. Um, and a little help can go a long ways for some people. Um, and they might not slip into these other categories if we were able to help them. So that's always the challenge for us. I want to talk to you a little bit about this is from the demographer's office. And you guys have seen this, but what this graph shows is and the, the growth in the population, right? And if you look at those black and the green bar, um, uh, bars, part of the bars, you see that's the 60 and over population. And what this graph showed you is that from 2020 to 2050, our older population is gonna double. Um, and it is, and that's significant. We go for uh, about a half a million people to over a million people serving. And that's a challenge when we don't see the same kind of increase in funding. It's not predicted that we'll see that kind of increase in funding. So what are we gonna do? How are we going to? This is also something we need to share with everybody and their brother, because we have got to get our infrastructure in place right now. We can't wait another five years to get transportation going, to understand nutrition, to understand the kinds of needs that people are gonna have because we'll always be way behind. We have got to get on this. People need to know this. Everybody and their brother needs to understand about the aging of the population. Our governor does not get it. I'm sorry, I like the guy, but he does not get it. He's focused on children. We're building family homes. We should not be building family homes. We should be building, look at this, the under 60 population over the next 20, uh, 30 years goes nowhere. It's like 2% growth. We need to be building homes that will accommodate couples and single people. 
We need to be building transportation infrastructure. We need to be developing the services for an older population and no one is getting this. I have been saying this, y'all, uh, those of you who have known me for a long time, I have been saying this for the last 20 years. And we're here now, we're in the midst of it, and still people aren't, they're thinking, oh, we have to build more homes. We have to build, in, in some communities, we have to build more schools. But in, others, in, in other parts of our region, we have to look at what to do with those buildings. Can we, uh, can we take those old schools and convert them to affordable housing? What can we do with them without knocking them down, using that infrastructure and making it um, appropriate for the population that we have now and into the next 30 years? These are um, uh, more people are going to struggle um, uh, with disability. So as we see the population age, we are also going to see more people with disabilities. Take a look at these green lines, the green part of the bar. See how it grows over time? These are This reflects people who are living with disabilities. Um, or no, sorry, and this is independent living. Did I pass the... I got to go backwards. This is the, I'm sorry, I can't see it because my bar is over the top of it. Is this the one living with disabilities? Yes, this is it. So this is the one you can see more and more people struggling with uh, people living with disabilities. Um, and so what does that mean? More transportation, more help for people with your, their yard work, with housework, um, more uh, uh, more people needing assistance to live independently and more people needing uh, help or, or may have to move to a higher level of care. This is people living um, independently. People want to live independently. We've all talked about this, right? This number is going to grow. These folks are going to struggle to live independently, whether it's Cognitive, uh, cognitive challenges or physical challenges, it's gonna be harder. More people are gonna have a harder time living independently. That means community-based services are more important than they've ever been, ever in history. It's more important now for us to have community-based services and will be for the next 30 years. So we did the community assessment survey for older adults. Um, this survey is to identify community strengths and supports um, uh, to support successful aging. Uh, it articulates specific needs, estimates contrib contributions made by older adults, and develops estimates and projections of residents' needs in the future. It was a, a random sample of older adult households, multi-contact method, um, and then it was the data was statistically weighted to reflect the older population. We use this data for kind of three different ways to make informed decisions kind of now, planning, right? Resource allocation, advocacy, engagement. Um, we're looking at it intermediately, so in the next four years, what programs are we going to need to develop or support to meet community needs? What, um, how do we make our programs that are, are in existence better? And then what policies are we going to need to have? Um, you know, what kind of advocacy, what, what should we be promoting? Um, the housing is a really good example. We need to do more of that, affordable, accessible housing for older adults. Um, and then long-term, how do we support a community um, that's prepared for older adults and allows them to be healthy, engaged, empowered, independent, productive, and vibrant, much like you were talking about, Phil, earlier on. So when we look at the topics, right, um, in the in the, the COSOA reports, and remember, Mindy's going to send you a link to your COSOA in your county, um, so you can take a look at this. When you look at the score, this is out of a hundred. It's a little bit different than the way they score in school. So zero is poor, 
33 is fair, 67 is good, and 100 is excellent. So you can see in this community livability, community livability is how a community responds to its older population and how they're, how they're setting up their community to allow older adults to live independently and thrive, basically. So um, the, the regional COSOA report, this is the, the results from the Dr. Cog region COSOA report. Um, the people, you know, say it's a, it's a good place to live and retire and recommend, and they recommend remaining in their commu community for retirement. The area that we see the most challenge in is employment and finance in this category. Employment and finance was a low score. Now this, if you recall looking at COSOAs before, this is a big long report and it shows data in a variety of ways. So if you're really interested in this kind of thing, it's worth taking a look at. Um, but this gives you kind of a high overview of what's going on. And then equity and inclusivity, right between um, fair and, and good. Um, health and wellness is, is um, again, you know, right between, well, a little closer to fair uh, than good. And that includes safety, physical health, mental health, healthcare, and, and the options for independent living. Uh, this is the bane of my existence. You all know this um, information and assistance. I, it feels like no matter what we do uh, for the last 35 years that I've been at the Area Agency on Aging, it is so hard to help people understand how to get the information they need and the assistance when they need it. There's been a little change though, and we saw this four years ago. I saw more of it this time around when I did community conversations. People said, oh, there's a ton of stuff on the, on, out there. I just don't know what to believe or how to access it. So 15 years ago, people used to say, I don't know how to get information about services that are available for older adults. I don't know where to go. Now people know where to go, but it's too much information. It's overwhelming. They say, I don't know if I can trust it. I don't know if I should, I don't know if I should call that person because it's so overwhelming. And I don't know if it's a trusted place I can go to. And so that continues to be something that we heard. More of a right, what's the problem? Overwhelming, right? Response. Uh, Let me show you how this works. Information to go through. Um, productive activities is an area. This is like, the, uh, it, it, do people listen to me? Do people, um, do I have enough opportunity to do things that I enjoy? Can I afford the things that I enjoy? Um, uh, are, are, are there volunteer opportunities? And then caregiving, um, are, are caregivers supported in our community? So the good news that we got from this survey is about 87% say that they think their overall quality of life is good. So these are older adults saying 87%, I think my overall quality of life is good. Here's some good news, yay, good news, finally. Um, <laughs> in the survey, we had people, the highest scores in the survey were in these areas. So 70% or more said the ease of travel by car is, was good or excellent. Ease of getting to the places you usually have to visit, good or excellent. Opportunities to, to attend religious or spiritual activities. Again, up from last year, up from years previous. This was a big area. We've put a lot of effort into this. I don't know if we can... I think it's a combination of services um, and, you know, Dr. Cogs, uh, uh, as well as a whole other, a lot of other communities really focusing on trying to help people get to where they need to go. It'll be interesting to see if this stays um, as something that's rated high in the next four years or, or if it goes down. Um, ease of walking in the community. These are the highest scores I think we've seen 
in the four times that we've done in the last 16 years um, for, for these kind of transportation scores. Um, again, we also saw it in recreation opportunities, games, arts, library services. I, we heard more library services. The libraries have really stepped up in our communities and are particularly important to older adults. Um, opportunities of volunteer to volunteer. Um, people said that they, they knew more about opportunities to volunteer. And then preventative health services got a good rating. And we think that's largely due to COVID, but, but that was definitely an increase from the last four years. I'm gonna stop right here. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, Jayla? Yeah. Uh, as, we're, as we're going through this, um, uh, I'll have a I'll have a comment later around uh, intergenerational socialization, um, but I I don't know if that was a question that was out there, but um, it's it's probably a comment that I'll get to later. Okay. So some of our lowest scores. This shouldn't be surprising to any of you. Availability of accessible housing. 75% um, or more said this was a problem for them. Um, so availability of accessible housing, which means no step entry, single floor living, wide hallways, the cost of living in our community. Our older adults are struggling with the cost of living and we're seeing it more than we've seen it in the last um, uh, 16 years. Uh, and even before that, because we did a, a, a survey the, the prior, so it's the last 20 years. It's, this is really um, showing a, a, a big problem in our region. <clears throat> and 50% of the older adults reported having problems with these things, not knowing what services are available to older adults in your community. Um, doing heavy and intense housework maintaining your home. I heard this in community conversations over and over and over again. Um, there's this wonderful gentleman and um, I, I just he just keeps on sticking in my head. He was talking, uh, he, he was Spanish speaking and we had Spanish uh, interpreters uh, over at SWIC, the Southwest Improvement uh, Council. And he said, my home is old as I am or older and it's falling apart and I need help. People talked about in our community conversations, holes in roofs, um, you know, uh, water heaters and heating systems and electricity, electrical systems that weren't working. Uh, there's a huge need for home maintenance. It's expensive and people are nervous about uh, contracting with someone that they don't know. They don't have a lot of money. If they save it up, they're afraid they're gonna be swindled by someone. Um, having adequate information or dealing with public programs such as social security, Medicare and Medicaid shows how important it is to have benefits programs. They're complicated. They seem to get be getting more complicated and people need help um, and and we need help in different languages. That was also very clear. Understanding what people could qualify for is so more important, it's so important. I don't know if it's more important than it was because every person, but it really, as, as resources get more limited, it's really important to know what you could qualify as far as um, benefits and public assistance. 40 to 50% of the region's older adults identified having um, challenges in the following areas with physical health, yard work, staying physically fit, feeling like your voice is heard in the community. This was different in different parts of the region. Some areas there was like, oh, they don't care about me at all. They don't listen to me. You know, we're trying to, they're trying to kick us out of our our space at the senior center and then other communities were um, talking about how they did feel heard and they did feel like they were, uh, their voice was heard and that people were trying to, people in power were trying to meet their needs. 
it was kind of all over the place in the region. I have to say that I, I, I think board members that have been at Dr. Cog and that are leaders in their communities, they're having influence because um, a lot of those places that have strong Dr. Cog board members also have, um, uh, we heard positive things about aging in those communities. Um, and then the last one is having enough money to meet daily expenses. It is expensive to live in general, but it's expensive to live in the Denver metro area. Uh, the cost of gas, you know, we were still during the community conversations and during this survey, this was done in the winter of last year, um, fall and winter of last year. You know, we were, we were dealing with pretty hefty gas prices and food prices and they've lowered a little bit a lot. So that was a big deal. This gives you an idea of the numbers of people that we think um, are, are, are dealing with issues. Housing, we think over 20, uh, uh, 288,000 people are struggling uh, uh, related to housing. So this gives you an idea of the numbers of people impacted by these issues in our region. Eleven percent of caregivers, um, we think, are, are are struggling. About eighty thousand folks in the region. It's a lot of people when you think about this. Give you a little time to absorb this mobility. One hundred and sixty-two thousand folks. So um, for my staff that's on on this, um, <laughs> for the mobility staff, this is why you're feeling so stressed. <laughs> Validation. Um, all right, so they talked about COVID-19 and particularly social isolation. We learned a lot about social isolation during the pandemic, right? We always knew isolation was a problem for older adults, but I don't think we understood the physical and mental impacts isolation can have on people. And it kind of, those of us who have been in the field for a long time, I, it kind of shook me and said, hey, wait a minute, wake up to this. We need to think about what's going on. They ask us right now um, what happened during COVID. So this is this is COVID, and then I'll talk about social isolation. So they said, what what was the impact um, to the area agency on aging and its contracted service providers uh, of COVID? And so COVID scaled back services, right? And some stopped providing services altogether. And as you recall, three of our um, providers just closed their doors. Um, there were a lot of staff layoffs or staff had to quit. Some staff said that it wasn't worth risking their health uh, if they served older adults and they quit. Um, so we lost volunteers, a lot of volunteers, a lot of volunteers in the region um, stopped volunteering. We had clients die. We had staff get sick, um, significantly sick, like with oxygen and hospitalizations. Um, we had to reduce uh, client contact, which was really hard for social workers. We're used to talking to somebody. We understand there's a problem. We don't really understand what's happening. So we go out and we look at it and we talk to people and we assess the situation and we couldn't do that. And that was really, really frustrating for a lot of our staff and a lot of the contractor staff. Um, we had to provide a lot of personal protective equipment and cleaning supplies. Remember, um, all the stuff that transportation companies had to do to clean their vans and to clean their vehicles and all the stuff we learned over time, but we continue to have to do that because COVID is still out there. Uh, uh, the direct impact to the area agency on aging, um, uh, there, was, there was positive things that happened as well, right? We received more money than we've ever had ever in history. Um, uh, as a result of all the COVID relief money. And what that did was allow that combined with the federal government relaxing all of those requirements. They said, you don't have to do all of the requirements. 
and the state relaxed the policy and procedure manual. And they said, serve people, just do what it takes to serve people. Track it, monitor it, make sure you know where the money's going, make sure it's actually being delivered, but you can be flexible. And that allowed us to really respond to needs quickly um, and, and allowed us a lot of flexibility, which was wonderful, I have to tell you. We were able to say, okay, here's a problem. Let's figure out how to meet it. Somebody needs food in this area. Someone needs transportation. Oh, we need to get folks to a vaccination site. Let's do it. Really flexible funding um, and providers really willing to do whatever it took um, to, to serve people. We were able to adapt services and change services to meet the evolving need. Remember in the beginning, it was all about food delivery um, and supply delivery and uh, medication delivery. And then it changed into um, helping people get back to like dialysis and um, appointments that they needed to go to, cancer treatments. And then it was getting people vaccinated. It's just changed all the way through COVID. And um, we continue to see um, needs evolving and changing. It encouraged innovation in service delivery. We had to do what we had to do. Um, we just, there was need and we had to respond. And so there was a lot of innovation at the AAA level as, as well as at the, at the contractor level. We developed new services, developed new partnerships, and we strengthened relationships with county health and human service departments. So that was a positive thing, result of COVID. The ongoing effect of, of on the AAA and, and our community service providers is service reductions, staffing, as you, you know, we were talking about in the beginning continues to be a problem for our, not, not as much for us as it is for some of our contractors, though we continue to have people resign and leave. Uh, overall, the AAA lost almost 50% of its staff. Um, I told you uh, that uh, the majority of those folks moved out of the state of Colorado. Um, and, and I think 12 or 13 of them just left human services and social work altogether. Um, it was a very, very difficult time for people. Uh, it suppressed staff and volunteer levels among contracted service providers uh, compared with pre-pandemic levels. So a lot less staff and a lot less volunteers. I think the staff are recovering, the volunteers are taking longer to recover um, because COVID is still out there. Uh, and because others have gone to different parts of the country and some have found other volunteer opportunities. And so it, it is still, the impact of COVID is still it affecting us. Increased cost for labor, oh my gosh. I think we've all felt that, that our service providers, what we're paying now for labor is much more expensive than it was pre-pandemic. Food levels have gone up, gas levels, Gas costs have gone up. Supply issues are getting better, but still in some parts um, are, are a problem. Um, but you know, even at the beginning of, of the year, we were still dealing with some severe um, supply chain issues. It's getting better though. We had loss of contracted service providers and difficulty in partnering with new ones, particularly the Area Agency on Aging for us. Um, was partnering with in-home health service providers. So we lost contracted service providers. Some closed their doors. Some decided not to do um, what we were paying them to do. And uh, it was hard finding new um, partners. We are, we just got a new partner in that area. And so we are building back up, I think, uh, well, at least last week, we didn't have anyone on the waiting list anymore. I don't know if that's still true, Fonda. I don't, it's just there. Um, we continue to have COVID-19 outbreaks and related um, safety protocols. So we still have to deal with those issues. 
uh, you know, um, outbreaks and an outbreak can only be two people in a nursing home, but it's still considered an outbreak. The ombudsman still have to go through all the safety protocols. If there's outbreaks um, in some places, you don't get transportation services. If there's an outbreak in some, and counties are different. So that's what makes it hard too. Um, in the beginning of the year, we are really having problems with uh, uh, opening and closing of congregate meal sites opened up in Inglewood and then it shut down two weeks later because we had COVID and then it opened up again and shut down. And now we're not even back open for congregate meal sites. They've gone to grab and go because it was just so difficult to keep on opening and closing these sites. Any questions at this point? Jayla, this is yes. I couldn't get my thing to unmute, <laughs> but um, we are we don't have a wait list and we are taking referrals as they come in and and getting assessments done um, quickly, usually within a couple days. But awesome! Um, as, as Isn't that exciting? Set up. Yeah, it's it, compared to the beginning of the year. That's pretty good. It, it's it's amazing, and it feels really good to be able to um, tell people that there's no wait list. And we actually yeah. have um, advertised that some. We've called Senior Resource Center to let them know. Um, so that they can refer folks if their list is getting too long. Um, we're reaching out to those congregate meal sites um, where the grab and goes are so that they can let folks know. We've reached out to um, low income housing. And, and so, and Fonda was gonna reach out to um, Jewish Family Services as well. That's great, really wonderful. So the effects of social isolation, like I said, we knew it was a problem before the pandemic. We learned a lot during the pandemic. And now we're like, what are we going to do about it now that we understand it so much better? It's hard because we do know how important it is. Um, and, and yet there's not money to do it. So um, remember in, in, in the early days of COVID, I'm sure you all remember this, older adults were told to shelter in place. They were told to shop at designated times, um, avoid visiting in family and friends uh, to reduce their exposure to, to COVID-19. Every night on the news, they would give you the death rates of people that died and they'd say, but they're largely in the people 65 and older. This really impacted the people that we serve. They were impact, they were traumatized in some cases by this. We heard people talking about still fear of going outside, still fear of being agoraphobia, you know, uh, uh, being in crowds or, or uh, being outside around people. Um, there was, there's, we heard people talk about being angry and frustrated uh, in the community conversations, losing two years of their life at this stage of their life. They were mad. Um, feeling frustrated. Some didn't think that we should mask and shouldn't be separated. They were mad about that. And others said they, you know, that they were still afraid to go out. But that wasn't the worst of it. The people who suffered, I think, the most were people who live in nursing homes and assisted living residents. Remember, visitors were banned. Residents were cut off from all social contact. There was no chatting in the hallway. They couldn't dine together. Family and friends couldn't come. Therapists couldn't come. Ombudsman couldn't come in the beginning. Individuals in nursing homes and assisted living residents were confined to their rooms. Some residents were moved out of their rooms to facilitate the creation of COVID-19 units. So many, and then and then lots of staff left. So they were being served by brand new people that they didn't know who changed often. All the losses that the residents of nursing homes and assisted living had to go through during this time. And many, many lost friends and loved ones due to COVID-19. And we saw decreased cognit cognitive rates and we saw decreased physical abilities and Increased anxiety and depression um, has been attributed to uh, the loss of social interaction during the pandemic. Like I said, increased cases of agoraphobia, decreased physical abilities, 
and increased levels of confusion. Older adults reporting having increased feelings of sadness, mourning, and frustration at, um, at the loss of time and the loss of friends and family. It was a really, really, really difficult time. The, the thing that I remember is in the beginning of the pandemic, we were asking our contractors to um, do reassurance calls. There's a way to keep money flowing into organizations, but it was also helping people just connect, right? And someone calling them weekly or every few days to see how they were doing, having that connection, giving them accurate information, which was hard to figure out, remember in those early days, actually a lot of the pandemic, there were so many mixed messages. Um, and I was talking with someone and, and he said, well, it's not much different than it was before the pandemic. I don't feel that much different. I didn't do much before that. And, I, and that kind of just always has stuck with me because it's true for so many people, they did stay in their homes. They didn't have a lot of contact. As resources allow, this is a big caveat right there. The Area Agency on Aging, I, I, this is what I'm hoping to do, but I have no idea if we're gonna be able to do this. Um, providing funding for so solutions like voice assistant technology, right? We saw all of those, there's a lot of technology. The Older Americans Act is talking about technology, funding more technology, things like medical alerts, things like assistive technology, but also like the Echo Dots, right? And, and I think, Carrie, you told us how successful some of the Echo Dots were for your clients. Um, and they can be, you know, you can say, sing me a song or tell me, you know, tell me a funny limerick or tell me a joke and they will do that. And there's some interaction there. Play my favorite songs, play songs from the 20s or the 30s or the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, whatever it is. Um, they can enhance your life. And so I'm thinking that the, it looks like the Older Americans Act, if they can find more money, will, will um, increase uh, uh, funding for this area. Please help me, uh, Mindy, if there's any hands up. Uh, develop more virtual education. So counseling and engagement activities. There have been some really cool things that have happened, right? Uh, virtual education. We know that our hoarders, hoarders uh, group from Jefferson Mental Health uh, has had huge success in counseling uh, with their group. Uh, we're seeing more and more people going to virtual counseling um, as well as engagement activities, right? Uh, we saw drum circles, we saw sing-alongs, we saw just community kind of just chat sessions, right? Where people would get on and talk. Um, and those are wonderful things to do. They're really hard to track and fund. I mean, it's not hard to track, but to, to show outcome other than people saying they're happy. But I do think that the, if, if the people at the, administration and community living stay in place, right? There, there's not turnover at that level. There's a lot of um, uh, excitement about virtual options. The, the best, they always say, it's better to have people come to you, but if they won't come to you or can't come to you, then doing these virtual things is the next best thing to in-person. Um, we'd like to start a nutrition voucher program and partner with restaurants. So there are some areas in the region that are very underserved. Um, and we, uh, Fonda has been kind of taking the lead on this in the next four years. And we were going to start faster on this program. Uh, we learned a lot about what other AAAs are doing in the state and across the country. Fonda's got a lot of information on this but it provides nutritious meals as well as it increases social activity. We may look at underserved parts of the region or we may look at underserved people, like maybe 
um, the refugee population or other underserved populations that have different dietary needs or desires than, than we uh, serve now. Revitalize the congregate meal program. This is hard because people are not coming back to congregate meal sites. And remember in our funding, we have this whole section of funding. It's like a, a silo of funding that's designated for congregate meal programs. And we're having a heck of a time figuring that out. We can use some of that money to do a, a, a restaurant voucher program if we want to. And we may have to because we can't spend the money right now in congregate meals. People are not coming back. One of the things, one of the, the consequences of, of COVID was that we lost transportation to our meal sites. So those little circulars that, that um, seniors resource centers were doing, picking up people and taking them to the meal sites, VIA does not do that and doesn't have the ability to do it. Um, we've had Jayla, conversations. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Perla has her hand up. Perla. Question regarding this. I have lots of questions, but I'll, I'll skip <laughs> to this slide. Um, you know, we tried to do congregate um, older adult uh, meals. And one of the things, one of the ways we were going to do that was working with current schools and rec centers that were feeding young kids. Yep. And the whole idea, and I had, I had conversations going on with the rec centers and, you know, I, I even had um, discussions with the food organization that uh, does the young, the, the food for younger people. And we had talked about, you know, um, a lot of older people are taking care of grandkids. Mm -hmm. And so they're already being fed at these locations, but they're not being fed older adult food, you know, so they're eating what the kids are eating. And sometimes they need, you know, more, they're diabetic or they have special needs. And so we talked all through that and then COVID hit. And yeah. so we might um, have that conversation again, because if they're, and, and, and Sharon had provided us a list of like all the places that were already supplying food. And so we were trying to supplement those meals in different areas, not in the same areas. So I think this warrants for additional conversations about where we, what we were talking about before and yeah. the areas that older people are already going to because they have um, grandchildren going there or because yeah. other family members are going there because they're the same neighborhoods. Yeah, they're, they, they they're are marginalized neighborhoods, neighborhood, which is really good, right? Yeah. And so there's a lot of a lot of our rural areas have um, the AAA partner with the schools to offer food, but it does take some tweaking of the of the menu, right? Because yeah. of the older Americans Act requirements. Um, but and then the other thing is the seating. It's hard for people to get in that that kind of yeah the the tables, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we need different types of yeah. tables um because we had Denver talked through all of that yeah yeah, yeah. Except for the except for the seating we had talked about like how we would identify the meals for older adults and how we would identify the meals for the children and so um there could for, even be transportation too because they yeah. have buses right we should and, talk and, about this more yeah yeah we should talk about this because i think it's i think there's an opportunity here um, we know the things we do know is when you offer entertainment at meals, people come like that. I have y'all has anyone seen the Elvis personator out there impersonator who goes to meal sites. He volunteers this time. He, he doesn't look anything like Elvis. He sounds kind of sometimes like Elvis, but he is an entertainer and he makes people laugh and people stay longer and they come because of him. And so how can we incorporate that? Right. And how do we, provide funding for that because that's not free. He donates his time, but um, most people would not donate their time. And then also providing things like education, mm -hmm. health clinics, you know, yep. let's do foot clinics and blood pressure checks and um, what else, you know, whatever else we can do to combine those things to entice people to come. It is um, people got out of the habit, people moved away, people may not meal site, um, the congregate meal sites have change the location some are 
Some closed down. I think we had four or five that closed down altogether and they, they, they're not gonna start up again. And so finding new meal sites is important and figuring out new ways to do this. We have got to figure out how to do this because it's more than just a meal. A meal is incredibly important. It's that socialization piece that's so, so important. Uh, for people's health, mental health, as well as physical health. Jayla, this is Jim. Yeah. One of the things I think we mess up on, this is from a person who, I have a pretty good grasp in nutrition, is we worry about providing at, our, uh, at, a, at a special occasion, real nutritious meals. We ought to provide anything a senior would eat. I, I totally I remember, agree with you. I totally agree with you. I wish you could talk with our federal nutritionist. They, because, they 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 don't understand that yeah, it's no. it's for a social occasion, not for that they're going to it's be eating every day. Food in the body, get food in the body, um, and you know I, I I think it's I think we should be I think we should think a lot about nutrition. Nutrition is important. Malnutrition has gone up in older adults because they're even those who are who are healthy, relatively healthy. They don't have the appetite they used to have. They go to the crackers and cheese and they call that a meal. That's not a nutritious meal, right? Um, so yes, malnutrition has gone up. Nutrition is important, but getting people food in their bodies is really important. Now, not necessarily chips and, you know, soda, but, um, you know, there's a, a happy in between, but our federal nutritionist is just, just it ha every meal has to be a 33 and a third of the nutritional value that someone needs in a day. And that's a challenge sometimes. All right, now we're gonna talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What they asked in this is how we are going to expand our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what I said is we will tailor outreach and messaging to targeted populations in underserved areas, translate materials, and we do a good job of that, but we need to translate more services into different languages, um, increase virtual services, uh, uh, again, to access care, mental health support, education and engagement, and then train contracted service providers on cultural competency, supporting LGBTQ individuals and implicit bias training. This is one area that the feds have, have um, called out and they want us to include um, in our training. We do um, LGBTQ training already. And so we will be asking or um, providing that opportunity to our contractor providers, as well as um, implicit bias training. Uh, we're gonna increase transportation services, hopefully, and remove barriers to transportation. We continue to do that. We are constantly, you know, currently funding eight community-based uh, transportation providers and trying to, um, as well as doing um, mobility management and in uh, the Dr. Cog office, really trying to figure out how to help people not only get where they need to go, but get to where they want to go in the most economical way that we can. Um, we are still between our, our office and the eight transportation, uh, transportation providers turning a thousand people away a month that want service. We are not able to provide them with service, a thousand people. Um, and it's only going to continue. Remember those graphs I showed you? We have got to get our hands around this and more people need to understand how important this is. And I don't know how to do this. I mean, I feel like I, I'm not, everybody, we should just all start talking about the importance of understanding the aging demographics and then um, what it's gonna take to serve that population. And most everyone you're talking to is gonna, you know, it, it, everybody's aging, but they're gonna be there too. By 2030, a lot of us are gonna be needing those services. Um, we're gonna translate the Aging Mastery Program into two more languages. Remember, this is the um, evidence-based program that we translated into four languages to serve our um, refugee community. And we're gonna translate it into two more working with 
um, the National Council on Aging, as well as uh, CSU. Uh, support uh, participant directed and person centered planning for older adults and their caregivers in case management out options counseling in home assistance. This is something we already do. We will continue to do this, really asking them to help us. You know, it's it this is being person-centered, participant directed, that the client tells us what they want and how they want to achieve it. So my best example is the doctor says you need to lose weight, you need to lose 20 pounds, and you go home and you know you need to lose 20 pounds, but you're not gonna do that. And then someone who goes in who's focused on um, person-centeredness will say, what do you want to accomplish? And they say, I just want to walk my pet around the block. And I can't do that now. And I really miss that. Okay, let's. what's it going to take to get there? So we're going to start by walking to the mailbox. And then we're going to start, then we're going to go a little bit further. And guess what? Usually, you also get some weight loss, maybe not 20 pounds, but the person is getting healthier, losing weight and doing what they want to do. It's much more successful when we focus on what the person wants and, and, and we ask the participant to help direct that plan. Um, and we already talked about this. We are going to make our aging advisory committee um, more diverse. The ombudsman program, they ask us to talk about the ombudsman program in particular. Um, so we saw increase, this is right from Shannon's mouth, um, <laughs> areas that we wanted to focus on. Um, so we saw a lot more increase of abuse and neglect of older adults, older adults resulting um, in staff, as a result of the staff crisis. Um, and it affects resident quality of life. So we want to make we really want to advocate a, around the staffing crisis. Again, we need to increase awareness about how bad the staffing crisis is and how it's impacting the lives of the residents who live there, right? We need to reestablish basic residents or rights for residents. So what we see the health department doing now is they, they cite facilities for being out of compliance with a regulation, but they don't cite um, residents' rights. And I'll give you an example of when I was an ombudsman, what I would see is they'd say uh, residents weren't getting bathed appropriately or the colites weren't being answered. And they'd cite them for short staffing, but they didn't cite them for the residents' rights violation, the indignity of not being bathed or having to sit in your urine and feces. We need to reestablish this. Residents' rights is just as important as the quality of care. It is just as important. It's not, care doesn't trump rights and rights doesn't trump care. It, they're, they're equal. Um, it's so important that facilities, that the health department sends a message to facility staff saying, no, it's not okay for you to treat people um, like they're less than. Uh, and we're not seeing that right now. Advocate for formalized oversight of guardians has been a problem for years. I don't know. Um, Shannon, are you on? I can't see. Yeah. Do you want to talk about these last two? Um, Sorry. But you know, yeah. <laughs> Again. Um, with, regards to, with regards to the guardianship, you know, guardianship is one of those things that just ties our hands off. And if there's a guardian involved and I mean, essentially a court then has put them in place, to make decisions, but we have guardians who have been appointed in, in situations that maybe aren't doing what is in the best interest of the person who they are they are placed in guardianship over. And sometimes that's a family member, um, but also sometimes it's a professional guardian um, who really, there's not a lot of checks and balances. And so we have some um, well-known guardians in our area who are, um, in my estimation, being financially and um, physically abusive in, in which and in, which and how they're they're managing their their clients and or their if it's a parent or a family member's care um, and finances and it gets difficult because the courts 
really don't provide there's there's just not the the laws in Colorado are loose and it's something that was being worked on um with a, a lot of attorneys involved before the pandemic took place and as we're hearing it's kind of changed everything once the pandemic happened everything stopped um and then obviously just increasing education and awareness around our program we we don't like hearing we wish we had known about you when um, when families find out that we exist and they didn't know until after it's too late, that's ex extremely disheartening. And so we want to be able to, I don't know if I am in a position to make more work for myself or the team, <laughs> but <laughs> we'd like people to be aware of the program. So when there is a situation and there's lots of situations right now that there's at least somebody who can not necessarily always fix it because everything's kind of a mess right now, but just somebody to stand with them in their corner makes a huge difference. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Now you want to continue? Oh, yeah, you want to talk about the Pace Ombudsman program? Um, there's really not much of a Pace Ombudsman program. We're the only local Pace Ombudsman in the state. We have funding for less than one full-time Pace Ombudsman. Um, and that is not something that has been pursued heavily at the state level to increase that funding. It's not a federal program. Um, and so there's a lot of dollars that are being bided for by various programs. But it proved to be a very um, advantageous program to run, as you guys knew that the, the, our PACE provider in our region actually had a sanction placed on them for not providing appropriate care. And I feel like that was very much a part of what the um, ombudsman was able to bring to light and, and the shortfalls. And then, of course, they went to a for-profit, Innovage went to a for-profit model. And so as these participants aren't getting the care, the CEO was making somewhere of $5.5 million that year. Um, so obviously we would like to try to push for additional funding for the PACE program, especially with home community-based services being such, such a push and something that you know is greatly needed. I think we'll see more and more people looking at the PACE model as an excellent model and, and on paper it is, it's an, it's an excellent, excellent choice. It's just the execution that can be difficult when you have a capitated program that then goes to a for-profit model. Um, and then just trying to bring the players together as far as we, we have these systems set up within the long-term care side of the world with the health department, you know, the people, the regulators and the enforcement agencies and trying to get that done on the pay side has been extremely um, fragmented. And so trying to align those processes so we can have a better flow of information. I mean, they're they're talking about restructuring the PACE program and when they go out for, for lack of a better term, but for their audit or survey, it's like, why wouldn't you call the ombudsman and find out what we're hearing? Because that's what surveyors do in long-term care. And that was something that was completely novice to them. So it's, it's things like that, that just bringing those systems sort of all together. And again, the PACE program started about a year before the pandemic. And so we're all still catching our breath. Um, and then increase outreach to targeted audiences. Um, trying to get into some of the communities where we know more peace participants are being served and some senior high rises, independent livings. Um, that's something we were doing before the pandemic so that they would be aware of our program um, because it does seem that the PACE model sort of has groups of senior high rise living situations where they're sort of targeting outreach, then we want to do the same thing to make sure that they know about our program so they can be provided what their options are, what their rights are, if there's concerns, complaints, who they can contact. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Evidence-based programs, this is a big push at the federal level, um, including evidence-based programs. Um, we currently fund evidence-based programs in the area of fall prevention, health and wellness, and nutrition. Um, and these are the programs that, that uh, we fund in those areas. We would like to increase over the next four years our evidence-based services to caregivers. We'd like to develop a caregiver evidence-based program. Um, for those of you who have been around a, a few years, You'll know I've been trying to do a caregiver program for a while and um, and have not been successful in finding one that I think works well in our region and that we could afford. Two of our contracted service providers have stopped providing uh, caregiver support programs. So we are going to start one internally that will engage two um, 
uh, evidence-based programs, uh, including powerful tools for caregivers, and maybe uh, it's called PEARLS. Um, we're still looking at the second program. Uh, um, Erica is, is doing all the research for this and getting ready to start this program. We will hire two staff. We do, this is a desert, this is funding um, th that is, uh, as is called, is there's designated funding in the Elder Americans Act for this program. Um, it is, it will be region-wide where the other two programs were not region-wide. Uh, it will, um, we'll have two staff people at this point um, moving within two years, I told Erica to offer Spanish uh, speaking services as well in this area because there are a lot of Spanish speaker speaking caregivers out there. Uh, so uh, this this is designated funding that's not going away. It's actually been increasing in the Elder Americans Act. So uh, we think we can do this program and sustain it uh, at least for the next four years, as long as we get the, the at least level funding from the feds. So one of the things that we will need to continue to do is, um, and this is in the area of collaborative uh, or in, uh, innovation and, uh, and improvements, hard to do. Remember that during, in 2020, the Older Americans Act was reauthorized and there was all sorts of new requirements. I went over that a few months ago, right? And the, in the Older Americans Act, there was a companion bill that went along with it that would have increased funding by 30%, 30 to 40 in some cases, um, and, and ombudsman program even more. Um, but the Older Americans Act uh, bill went through and the money part of it did not go through. So we have these new regulations and no money to go with it. So that makes it really hard to do even what we were doing before the pandemic. Um, and over the next two years, as we lose the other funding sources of COVID relief, it's going to make it even harder. We have to collaborate. We have to work together. We have to do collaborative advocacy, right? Bring in our contracted partners, our community service providers, older adults, the Advisory Committee on Aging, you all, and national groups to, to ask for funding at the state level, but to also include payment for community services in the Medicare. A lot of demonstration programs going on. There's a lot of talk, both AJ and I are on national committees talking about this. We need to push for that because that's another revenue source. Our hospitals, as you learned last time from AJ, making referrals to us, they get paid for those referrals, but because we're not in the Medicare system, we don't get paid to provide the services and neither do our contracted service providers. That has got to change. We're on the cusp. It may only happen in nutrition and, and in transportation, but those are two big, huge areas of service that would help us then have extra money for other services if we had another funding source for those. So we've got to band together at the state as well as the federal level to advocate for older adults and for community-based services. It has to be. Um, there's a lot of talk right now, you know, I just sat through a, a, a session with the with committees of the of, of the House of Representatives in Colorado and Medicaid presentation for about an hour and it, it it's so frustrating because they're going to get millions and millions and millions of more dollars potentially and we're going to get nothing. Um, yet they're, they're in their presentation, they talked about how they're going to use community-based services to help that happen beyond their own network of community-based services. That means our services. And yet we don't get any of that money. And that's very frustrating and needs to stop. Um, new data systems. You know, we invest in a new data system. Uh, it's, I, I think it's going to be so much better and able to give us the data we need. Um, we're using the survey information we got and in-house gap analysis to analyze service needs and develop new services if we have the money. Guys, I'm honestly thinking we'll just be lucky if we could hold steady for the next two to three years. 
I don't know if we're going to be able to grow. The only way we're going to be able to grow is if we, if we partner with other people and we get different funding sources. Improve access to service by providing and funding more virtual services. I do think this is an area um, where we could reach more people is through virtual services, but it's got to be done right. And all those other infrastructure pieces, right, the accessibility, the training has to be in place as well. So we have to partner with the libraries. We have to partner with um, uh, the communities that are putting broadband in their in their um, it, it, you know it, along their highways. Um, we we need to be a part of those conversations. We're not a part of those conversations now, and we need to advocate for older adults um, during that process. Streamline assessments and reduce administrative burdens on contracted service providers. The Older Americans Act says this, they haven't done it yet, um, but we ask a lot of our contracted service providers. Um, they have to do a lot of documentation and you know, um, we need to streamline whatever we can to make the process or, or the, it, the money about the service and, and less about they need to follow the guidelines of the Older Americans Act, but if we can reduce any of those administrative burdens to, to, to make sure more money goes into services, that's what we need to do. Um, you know that uh, AJ and I are working on, and, and Sharon and her team, the whole team actually, the whole AAA, is working on increased coordination and data collection um, and outcomes re of referrals. We've been asking our contracted service providers to, to um, track the, the referrals they're getting from hospitals, gather the data. We're doing more efforts to gather the data so that we can tell the story of what's happening and hopefully influence someone and understand that if you get transportation, that individual is likely to be, to, to do better. If they get to go to their, their dialysis treatment or to their doctor's appointment or to their, uh, their, their cancer treatment or just to a follow-up appointment, if they get food, guess what? They're gonna do better. And that's a part of this overall um, advocacy and this push. You, I think you all know that we were invited to be a part of the Administration for Communities Living Community Care Hub. Um, and we'll do this with, uh, um, we're involved with this with other national and state uh, initiatives to, to look at social determinants of health and payment for community-based services. That's so important, right? We are all talking about social determinants of health and how important it is in sustaining health outcomes from hospitals and healthcare um, and community-based services are very important for that. Um, but they need to be paid for, and nobody's paying for them, um, including the Older Americans Act, because everybody's promoting it, and the older and and the administration of for uh, community living is saying, "Yay, yay! They're recognizing us, but we're not getting any more money for it. We need to have more money for it." Um, and we will continue to work with health providers and payers to demonstrate that investments in overall well-being of older adults reduces health care costs and improves health outcomes. Holy moly, there it is. I gave it to you. Um, it's like drinking from a water fountain, isn't it? Or from a fire hose. Uh, so that is the presentation. Now I'm trying to stop share so I can see your faces. Are you awake? Wake up. <laughs> no, he's, he's ready for a question. It, Jayla, as usual, it's not as much a question as a comment to uh, trigger some discussion. Um, uh, just a, a first comment is I'm not a terrific advocate of um, taking our older Coloradans and placing them in ghettos. I'm a big advocate of trying to find intergenerational housing and opportunities. Um, one comment. Um, in looking at the long term, um, some of the folks that are in school now or will be coming out of school over the next 30 years um, are still in school. Uh, and some, some of those folks are actually hopefully going to be some filling some of the staffing needs uh, that were needed across the space. 
So um, some element of uh, approaching schools and saying what kind of opportunities we can get for some of those students that are looking at volunteer opportunities uh, to maybe um, move into some of the space, whether it's a nursing home or assisted living facility or such, uh, would be an interesting way um, and possibly the, <clears throat> the contractors could help as well as the school districts in that. Uh, I think one of the things that you mentioned is uh, the libraries have done a, a pretty good job. Um, I think if we think about it, uh, what libraries have is human to human contact that's consistent. Uh, they're there uh, and uh, whatever we can do to mimic some of those will give older Coloradans some confidence and trust because that's one of the things that is is difficult. Um, <clears throat> I know in the past uh, families have benefited by having some aspects of navigation be in library locations but uh, libraries and schools and rec centers are places where folks tend to have uh, some element of trust. I know that requires some transportation, but not all of our older Coloradans need <clears throat> necessarily require all of that. Um, so I, those are some of my, my thoughts. And I think continuing to leverage our contractors, particularly those that are uh, along the lines of Meals on Wheels that have uh, regular deliveries and opportunities to contract people can maybe help uh, in getting to that uh, trust level and in information distribution uh, that is uh, pretty doggone important for all these folks to understand how to get through and navigate the networks. Thoughts? No, I, I, I think you're right. You know, um, to be honest with you, there's a lot of work to be done over the next 30 years. I'm worried about the next four, to be honest with you. Um, it's, I think it's going to be a hard time. Um, and I think that we have to get serious again. There have been times where, you know, um, aging was kind of in fashion and people talked a lot about it and there was a lot of enthusiasm. I do see that happening again. We just have to harness that and keep on talking about this, talking about how it's important. Most people do not understand that this demographic shift is happening. They think it's going to be like it has been all along, right? They don't realize we have more older adults than we have people, um, the teenagers. And, and so they think that we're going to do what we did the last 20 years. We can't. We have to. So creating that awareness, I think, is so important. And then we also need to create opportunities for young people to you know, a lot of young people don't necessarily think about going into serving um, uh, older adults. And um, we, we need to make that a little more appealing. And we, we are at Dr. Cog where, you know, we have an internship program. We're developing our interns. Um, we're expanding our intern program. We, we expanded our volunteer program, trying to not only have older adults be able to have volunteer opportunities, but um, but um, uh, also, you know, helping younger people who are interested in this area uh, get a step up, um, have an advantage. But these jobs don't pay wonderfully, and that's another problem. Um, and and until we start to value uh, taking care of older adults a little bit more, and that's social. I don't know what that's going to take. Um, but the next four years are going to be an interesting challenge. And that's just going to be a precursor for what the future is going to show. We have got to, if we have more money, we can do a darn good job of serving. And it, it doesn't take billions of dollars, like in transportation, right? We don't have to modify highways and do pavement projects and do corridors, for God's sakes. We can take one corridor. That's all it would take. And our services be awesome um but <laughs> um kelly, you know, it just, did you does kelly have a comment yeah, kelly. Question? yeah I, I just want to comment since i was the one who really compiled all the public input from the community conversations and the key informant sessions what i'm finding really interesting jayla is how 
how in sync that input is with the results of the Kosoa. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing to me because yeah. this is yeah. really my first time to get walked through both. And, yeah. and, and so I just kind of want to say that in spite of being disappointed with the returns from the Kosoa, the public input, which was quite extensive this time around, um, really uh, is in sync with, with that input. Plus the, all the targeted populations that we did for the community conversations, the refugees, the veterans, low income people. So we really did have a good representation of our targeted populations with, with those conversations. Thank you, Kelly. Jayla, that was just a beautiful presentation with so much information. And I know that you'll be emailing it to all of us for reference, but uh, to you and your entire staff, I know how much work that has been, but it's really valuable insight for all of us to take back into the communities. So yeah, thank and you. just to you let know, everybody a lot of staff know, worked on this. Yeah, go just ahead. Just to Mindy. let everybody know that it was attached to the agenda packet, so it is. You oh, guys already thank have you, the Mindy. Slides. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I think you had something. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I had a, just a couple things. Um, one on the demographics piece. Um, I show that those demographics, you know, that they're not exactly the same slides, but they're, they're close enough. I show those to people almost every day. And 95% of the people that I show them to, it's like, really? I had no idea that yeah. was happening. So I, I, it, what it brings to mind, though, is maybe there's something a, a, a lot broader that, that we should be thinking about doing in terms of communicating that information to the public, you know, like through public service announcements or, you know, through, you know, TV news, you know, something that gets the word out a lot faster than we can get it out. Yeah. Um, and then, We've been talking uh, about that too, um, how, how to do that. And when we started Boomer Bun, we did a, a communal kind of meeting um, mm -hmm. and invite a lot of different participants, you know, local governments and uh, anyone who wanted to come, education, all sorts of people came to that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at a hotel and had a, 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 a keynote speaker. And um, we got a lot of press around that. And it kind of, it, it's, it kind of got people excited about, about aging. And I think we need to do something like that again and then follow up with social media and maybe PBS. I don't know. I'm just try, I'm trying to think of affordable ways that we could do that um, uh, to get the word out. And, and maybe, I don't know, you know, how, how do we, and maybe this is something good for, for uh, our board members, you know, how do we help the board get this and then, and then, go beyond just understanding to action. I know um, when you did this, I mean, you're a perfect example. Kathy is a perfect example of, of really understanding this and then taking action. Um, and and how, do we, how do we do that again? How do we, how do we get that flame fanned and, and, and bigger? Well, there must be some media consulting people out there. You know, I don't know who they are. It just takes money, and I don't have any of that. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you know, there's yeah. probably some you know, people something without charging a lot of money. Yeah, um, yeah. If we just ask them, you know. Um, yeah. But you first I have think to that ask. social media is a wonderful outlet, and I know Jayla. Um, and then I'll move into the board reports because I know we're we're going to be off time. But um, there was a slide, not in this presentation, but I you had shared before that it said, and I think it's the same time frame that the seventeen and under population will grow by two percent, yeah. and the sixty five and older will grow by ninety nine percent. And yep. I use that all the time. I think what getting that word out to Bob's point is, is so important. And those very short, um, powerful statements stick with people instead of going through all the demographic. Um, oh yeah, so, no, I agree with you. Talk with your husband, please. I will do that. 
I Tell will him do to that. give me an internal family discount. I will do that. <laughs> But, yes. but the other thing, um, the other thing about this though, is you have to tell people over and over and over yeah, again. You. How many you know, times, Jayla? Seven or seven? 10? Yeah, seven, seven times. times. Seven so, times, seven different ways. Um, seven times. Um, Donna, did you have a comment before we move on? Yes, I just wanted to say that I'm not so sure the business schools and the marketing departments understand the demographics. Um, I'm married to a business consultant, and he kind of places aging along with other categories, but I don't know that they really understand the impact that it could all have. And I, I would love to have a conversation with him and and and, and maybe I, I'll buy him lunch. I'll meet you in Golden and buy you lunch. <laughs> if you can find him in town, I can <laughs> speak to the range there. In London. <laughs> He's on his way yeah, again. No yeah, but I, I think that would be interesting because um, I just, he knows what I do, but I don't think he quite understands. So <laughs> you could maybe tell him. All right. That would Thanks. be awesome. And get his feedback on, you know, because if, if we can get that. Remember, um, like Samsung was really into the aging of the population. And they were it was really cool for a while. And it's kind of fallen out of favor. It hasn't changed any. It's still the same. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is challenging um, to get that word out. Well, when he gets back from skiing, I'll talk to him. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank yeah, the you, thing Tom. about those big companies is, you know, if they don't get a good good reaction, they just drop it, you know. Yep. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's an issue, too. Um, one, just one other quick question, and that is, what was the reaction of the Dr. Cog board when you showed this? And I know we have a couple of Dr. Cog board members on here, too. So um, I, I, I did it really fast. We had a big discussion about the demographics beforehand, and there was a lot of com conversation. Um, my colleague, Zach, gave a presentation about um, uh, the demographic changes in the region. And, and that there was a lot of conversation about that. And so that was good. And there's a lot of awareness. There seems to be support, but I really was at up to the last like two minutes of the presentation. I got, I, I will tell you though, I had four board members reach out to me and say, good presentation, nice job, helpful information. I'll let, um, let's, let, let's Conklin. hear from our, Let's hear board, from our board president. chair Conklin. I want you to know board yes. chair Conklin and director Shaw explain or tell you more. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, Jayla's right that she took it right to the, the, <laughs> the, the time limit. And so we didn't have any real reaction questions that at the end of the presentation. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. I always think it's fantastic hearing this information, uh, but we didn't necessarily get a, a automatic feedback. I think the board has heard the demographics and kind of gets it. I don't know that other electeds necessarily do that, that don't have that on a regular basis. And as I was hearing the presentation today, I almost wonder if some electeds, um, you know, we, we've got a, a hundred page bill on housing that, that is, I think, very unfriendly to communities and, and seniors. And it may be that they think if we build lots of housing and lots of, of, of fancy stuff, maybe we'll battle that demographic trend. I mean, maybe they're trying to, to fight that demographic trend as opposed to understand it. That may be a really cynical attitude. <laughs> <laughs> but I had that thought as I was hearing the presentation today. Yeah, Wynn, that's do you good insight. Sure, that that may very well be the case. I mean, uh, um, and also um, from Executive Director Rex, who is normally here with us, he is speaking with the state about the uh, hundred-page housing bill and. Uh, so he's not joining us today, but um, I, I know I I often wonder if um, you know the the uh, legal immigration policy could include you agree to have a family of three. <laughs> uh, so I you know truly that's what we need is um, to to kind of continue the uh the cycle of young people being added to our society and uh i don't know i think it is um 
even nationally, but more so for Colorado, a huge problem. And um, I I often joke about being the uh, the lucky ninety year old who has a uh, a spry sixty five year old caregiver because you know th there won't be any any forty year olds left <laughs> you know to uh, provide care for for the aging population or the age advantaged population so. Um, it's a it's a really tough problem that we face and and uh i i do appreciate your presentation not only to us but to the board um because sometimes it does take a number of times to hear this and and have it sink in and what are the implications so i think people are probably at the point where they're beginning to to see the implications and uh and and they're somewhat frightening so um and kudos to uh board chair conklin because i think he was one of the first to appear with you jayla on no copay radio i actually have not appeared on no copay <laughs> no, radio. Yet. Um, no not yet I, I i got it's coming I was, up i was supposed to and then this thing called a pandemic hit <laughs> No, I was literally about to do it at that point in time. So hopefully soon. We have you oh, scheduled good. though, don't we? I I got an email about scheduling. I haven't done it yet. Okay. I, I've scheduling. been slow. I've been slow <laughs> responding. And I don't know I if am... the media might go along with um, public service announcements about um, even even. Uh, you know, you it could be a multi-pronged message about, did you know that through the Dr. Cog Area Agency on Aging, we offer these things to seniors, but we need your help to keep it going. Donate here. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, know, yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, multi-pronged, you know, we yeah, have these yeah. services, but also we need money. Okay. People react a lot better to a crisis. So if you, you know, if you can, if we can somehow use this information to create a crisis um, <laughs> and lay out some really audacious um, solutions, you know, that will eventually trickle down into something that can actually be done. But um, I, to me, you know, I, it's been my experience in the past when I was still working for a living, but um, it's something to give us some thought to. All right. Well, let's may I see. may let's, I uh, join uh, us? Yes. Um, <clears throat> everything that Bob is saying, um, I think, is something we need to kind of focus on because the brilliance of the presentations that we go through monthly kind of leave you awfully sad at the end of the meeting. And yet we haven't found a way to broaden the approach. And, and like, like Bob, I believe that not all PR people or marketing people are greedy, but rather that um, we need to find a way of reaching some of them and some media uh, to be of assistance. So that's that's one observation. The other one is a different subject, but one that is of importance to to some of us. This week's um, RTD board meeting is going to consider a new package, finally, of uh, for a new contract for the vendors who have been for the last year continuing on a contract that should have been renewed and many things have happened to uh, cancel that. This Tuesday, they will be talking about the fact of a proposal, a new proposal that is a proposal that only arrived in the last month of, for instance, canceling all of the uh, VIA's Accessor accessorized services, <clears throat> excuse me, and transferring them 
to two national groups. And um, the dynamics of the conversation is going to be kind of interesting. It's been uh, developing. It's hard to change a recommendation of a committee within RTD, but uh, the board will be approaching it for the first time in a very long time. And the impact of this decision on the group that I work with uh, via is dramatic because it's only been, uh, what is it, uh, 27 years that they have been providing accessorized service. And then all of a sudden, within the last month, the decision has been made to not renew that service. And so at our board meeting uh, two days ago, um, a couple of issues came up, which I think are really worthy of consideration by this group and others. The, the president, uh, Frank Bruno, wrote a letter, an extensive letter, I'm afraid. And I say afraid because for a meeting that's coming up, an extensive letter, letter is not the maximum approach for getting uh, attention. But the letter speaks to the fact that uh, if you're in the business of serving seniors at many, many ways, even delivering food in the Boulder area and such, to then have everything kind of collapsing without any discussion or opportunity and leaving the impact that uh, something is wrong, as an example, with this company for them to be dropped. There must be something they're not doing well. And the letter speaks to the fact that there are, is, is some issues going on that really um, RTD is going to deal with for the first time this Tuesday and will be significant, I believe, for uh, the whole senior um, transportation industry. I'm, I'm concerned about what you're saying and thank you for sharing that letter with us. Is that something I could share with the whole group? Sure. Okay, I will do that. Um, also, the thing that, that really worries me is that, you know, they're our largest provider of transportation. They stand to lose $35 million if they don't get this contract with RTD. That could impact their ability to serve the people we contract with them for um, uh, and serve. It, it, and, you know, even though, uh, you know, we have some ideas about expanding services, I'm not sure what, how that puts them in. They just got a new place that they, you know, that they, in Denver, that uh, a, a where or a place for them to, you know, a, a, a headquarters, so to speak. And um, it, it impacts, has the ability to really negatively impact the services they're a, able to provide us under our contract as well. I think the RTD, you know, the reason, the way these things work is there's multiple providers or multiple payers into a provider system. It helps us uh, be able to provide service to more people. And this is going to impact that ability. Um, I, I need to meet with, I, I want you to know text that I've asked for a meeting with Doug to see if there's anything, any way we could influence that um, and talk about it. I don't know these national companies. Um, I don't know what their record is. Uh, it, it just, it, it worries me because door through door um, has not been great by other service providers. Sometimes even VIA struggles with it, but they do training of their staff and others don't. And so um, I, I, I just, it, it worries me a lot. Tex, may I ask who these other national companies are? Yeah, the... There is one of them has been there for a long time called Transdev. They've done 25% of the service for, you know, probably 10 years. 
they will now be handling 65% of the service on of accessoride. And then the other is a new group called MTM, which has been hired two years ago to provide the the um, the assessment of who should be eligible for and make the eligibility determination for uh, accessoride users. They are now one of the people who are going to get the remainder of the contract. It's a Missouri group, um, no previous contact uh, with um, Colorado in any way. And so um, the whole situation is quite is quite um, quite interesting, especially uh, speaking to to Jayla's little comment. The the board met this Wednesday, and um, <laughs> it it was um, quite a distressful meeting, not only because of the coming decision. But the fact that the board is considering further withdrawing from Denver and RTD because of the, their behavior in the last couple of years uh, against people, local organizations, especially uh, VIA. And so is um, uh, it's kind of heartbreaking from my position. Mm. Boy, that could have some significant impacts to the region. Sure. I hadn't heard that text. Thank you so much for sharing. So that, it just came up out of the blue? It came up about out of the blue about a month ago. Uh, and, and like so many of these things at the moment with RTD, there's no transparency. And so rumors started to develop of the existence of this proposal and, and that kind of thing. But the announcement did not come forward for about two weeks. So the last two weeks, um, one tries to then enter the conversation which never existed. And so um, that, it, this is a, a dramatic opportunity. Now, I do have the, and, and we'll make available uh, through um, Mindy, the letter from, uh, from Frank, because um, it's, um, he's not attacking the situation um, because he feels that it will not succeed. Uh, because there's so many elements going on that uh, relate to these two organizations. And so, um, but the letter does ex express a situation of uh, some significance, I think, to the greater community. Mm -hmm. How many trips a month does VIA do for the entire metro area? Do you know? Or Jayla, do you know? Uh, no, Travis does. Is he on still? Travis? I just asked him this and I can't, I can't remember. I mean, but, I, I mean, they're significant. Like there, there are it, it, it is significant. It, yeah, and it's the only, as Jayla says, it's the only one is door through door now. It's yeah. the. Well, it's not the only one, but they do. I mean, they train, right? They train door Excuse through me, door. Excuse me, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and they, they are our largest service provider. Um, and I can't, cannot remember how many trips he told me they do a month. Um, but it's you, significant. I mean, it's, it's significant. really significant because yeah. I do remember SRC was doing, weren't they doing close to 10,000 a month? Chris? I don't recall. Yeah. I, I still I thought have. They were. I'm afraid to give a figure because. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot. It, it's it a lot. It is a lot. It's it a, lot. a lot. Okay. Well, please keep us posted on this issue because. I'm afraid that that could really significantly impact VIA's ability to serve then through the Dr. Cog grant. 
And then what you have to remember is that we'll have net less money next year yeah. if I don't, yeah, if, if we don't get new funding source, we'll have less money next year. Yeah. And so that's another cut for them. And will they be able to sustain in the metro that's area? That's it. That's and we a don't big have hit. a provider right now no. that has the capacity to do it. Now, you know, maybe these other two companies, but I don't know them. And I we like working with them. Bia. I can call Frank. I can call Bill Patterson and, and say, there's an issue. There's a problem, right? And, and we can resolve things. Um, that, that kind of um, partnership is really important when it comes to transportation. And, and, well, and, and they jump through hoops to get us started here in the metropolitan area. That's what I was going to say. They really stepped up to the bat when we needed them. Yeah. They really did. Hmm. Okay. Well, I know we are running over. Are there any other? Um... Travis says Via does about 3,000 trips per month. Oh, 3,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was thinking it was a lot more than that, but still that's significant. That's significant. Yeah. Thank remember you. they are. Yeah. I, I think probably SRC did more than that because we didn't have other providers at that time. Right. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Any other county reports or do our board members have anything else they want to contribute? Steve, when? I, I will just add on since I kind of left it hanging out there. The uh, Senate Bill 213 is the one that we talked about in terms of housing. Uh, this is me talking as an individual, not me on behalf of city council or in my role with Dr. Cog. I would just encourage everybody to keep an eye on this one. Uh, as Phil made reference earlier, it, it does things to take away local control from home, home ruled cities. In often cases, the, the local cities are the best to make some of those judgments about land use and what's going to work in that regard. So it's, it's a pretty interesting bill. Uh, they put out a press release that made it sound absolutely awesome. Uh, I think there are some concerns. There are concerns. Stay okay. tuned. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a slight, uh, just a real quick county update in Douglas. We will be holding the first of hopefully many um, town hall events that are completely focused on aging. Awesome. And I am really pleased that our commissioners are, are taking uh, the initiative and showing, putting the focus and a spotlight on aging. And it's an opportunity for our community and our older adults to really voice their feelings, concerns, questions, and, and challenges that they are having um, as they age in our county. So I will keep you all posted on that, but I'm hoping that it'll be the first of many. If you haven't taken a look at the Douglas County um, COSOA, do that. It's on our website. I um, need to look at it before okay, yeah. next Tuesday yeah. because I'm on the panel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, take a look yeah. at it. It gives some good information about Thank you. what we heard from, from folks in from here. Douglas. Good. Okay. All right, you guys. Thank you. I know we ran over, but boy, wasn't that worth it. And really good stuff today. And Mindy, when is our next meeting? It is on, um, well, I didn't, I don't even have it in the thing. Let me look at my <laughs> calendar real quick. I was just looking. I didn't catch that when I was doing it, but we are. I think it's April 28th. April 28th. You are correct. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks All right. Me. Have a lovely Thanks, weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye.